Hmm, I'm bored. Let's read a book. <laughs> I did not sleep well that evening, even after setting and checking the wards. I tossed on a narrow pallet, sweating as I pondered what I knew. The J on the tax levy had to have been Jurel. Jurel was some sort of advisor to the prefect, and Jurel did not particularly care for me. Then, to make me even more uneasy, in the night skies, thunder raged. Not the thunder of honest clouds striding among themselves, nor the man-made thunder of gunpowder blasting. Not even the illusory thunder of the wind created by Chaos Masters bent on enhancing the fears of an already too ignorant population. Thunder such as this I had heard only once before. On the plains of Sirtis, when the ice storms and the blizzard had done their worst to destroy me, I tossed and sweated, and on the other side of my curtain, Bostrick snored loudly and without any sense of rhythm. In the end, I did sleep, and without dreams that I remembered, which was probably for the best, since I woke with the start before dawn. I was soaked in sweat, though the night had been cool for summer, even for a long summer that was drawing to a close. After using the facilities off the alley, little more than an outhouse that drained into a covered sewer, and washing in cool water drawn from the cover tank in the back, I felt closer to human. Some fruit and a biscuit from the tray Deer Deer brought down helped more. We could have eaten upstairs, but in the mornings I never bothered, since I like to get started early, especially in the warm weather. Why, oh why, am I an apprentice to a master who loves mornings? Bostrick looked worse than I felt. But the words were merely a ritual he intoned every morning. He splashed his way through a sketchy wash, then wolfed down what I had left on the tray. They're all talking about you, he mumbled. Oh? I was checking the chest against the sketches in the plan book. Jerrell thinks you're from Recluse. I swallowed a cold lump in my guts, saying nothing. Daryl says he thinks you want deer deer around the shop. And Grizzard doesn't see anything remarkable in you, and wonders why anyone is making such a fuss. Shrugging, I took a last sip of Redberry and set the mug aside. Jerrell also told Daryl that the chairs for the sub-prefect were going to cause trouble but he wouldn't say why. Trouble. Chairs causing trouble. Then I shivered, recalling the reaction of my own staff to chaos. Once again, in pushing too hard, I hadn't thought through the consequences, and the chairs had been black oak. Are you all right? I shook my head. I'm fine. I just realized I had forgotten something. Although I knew I needed to talk to Brettle and I'd finished the door chest for Delta, I had held off on delivering it, perhaps because we had received so much from Brettel. I didn't want to impose so soon again on the millmaster. Whether he was Deirdre's godfather or not, in addition, Bostrick was not quite ready. But now I would have to watch every corner for the Duke's assassins. Despite what I had seen, except for Jarl, nothing pointed toward me yet. I felt some greater force was rushing from beyond my perceptions, straight for me, or I was just imagining things, believing I could sense what I could not understand. The world of order and thoughts just made life more confusing, not less. Already summer was coming to a close, the grasses were browning, and the hand of the long, hot summer pressed down upon Fenard like an open stove. With the heat, the varnishes gave off more fumes, even in the late mornings. Although I had tried to finish the work while Destrian took the rests that grew factionally larger each day, sometimes he persisted on tinkering with his benches, even as he coughed his lungs out. No longer did he pale when he coughed. He was pale all the time. Let Bostrick finish those joints, I suggested, 
I just came down. Are you trying to push me out again, Laris? I'm the shopmaster. It's my business, and no outlander will tell me how to run it. He glared at me even as he had to pour himself on the bench. He coughed again. I'm not trying to push you anywhere. Bostrick is your apprentice, and he's here to help you. If I can help him learn, fine. But how you can help is if you don't insist on doing everything. I pressed the touch more order upon his system, but only a touch. He was so fragile that anything more would have done more damage, and the coughing. Papa, added Deirdre, when she talked to her father, her voice was firm, gentle no matter what pain she held inside. All of you, you all want to put me away, even as he protested, Destron let Deirdre lead him up the stairs. I let down the pine as I motioned to Bostrick as soon as Destrum was out of sight. We looked over the bench Destrum had been resting against rather than working upon. Can you clean this up and finish it? I asked. Bostrick studied the seat plate. How would you suggest I fix this? He pointed to the beginning of an off-center hole, probably angled when Destrum started coughing. You've got one or two choices. Fill it and reset, or cut the size and redo the spokes, make it more ornamental. Bostrick lipped his lips nervously. Go ahead, Destron can't finish it. I didn't know how accurately I spoke. Dear Dare stood at the stairs. Laris? Her voice was almost matter of fact. Then she stood there at all, told us she needed something. Resourceful in all things, from running the accounts to developing her own cushioning business, to running the shop and household food budget. She had asked for nothing except once. Yet behind the quiet facade, I began to understand. Lay a strong will. I'll be right there. Catching Bostrick's attention, I said. Dressing, I need to discuss something. If a customer could show, just ring the bell. And I'll be right down. Then I followed Deirdre up the stairs. If she hadn't been so upset, I almost would have smiled at Bostrick's hidden appraisal of Deirdre. Papa, he's moaning, and he doesn't know who I am. The seeming work she did neatly laid on the table by the rear window. She probably earned more from the sewing than Destron did from his infrequent benches, and saved more than that from her handling of his accounts. Bostrick would do better than he knew, and I only hoped I had the time to help him be more than she knew. Destron lay upon the white bed, eyes closed, breathing raggedly and quickly, a bluish tinge to his fingers and grayish look to his face. His eyes opened. Chiron, where's the girl? I'm here, Papa. The voice was thin and low. Chiron, so cold. As I reached into the frail and wasted body, the burning, the pressure seared me, and I had to grasp the bedpost, even as my senses touched the knotted heart, easing a cramp there, letting the blood flow and strengthening what I could. The parts had yet enough firmness to strengthen. It took a long time, gently as I had to work, and I didn't remember sitting down. Laris, Laris, cool cloth touched my forehead. My head was not splitting, but a dull ache and a great tiredness encouraged me not to move. Something to drink, Redberry? I asked hoarsely. Dear, they brought me a cup. A few sips and I felt almost normal, if lightheaded. I eased myself out of the chair and tiptoed over to the bed. Destron's color was no longer grayish, only pale, and he slept. I nodded, but wondered how much longer I could hold him together, and whether I should. Recalling the pain I had felt in touching him, my eyes blurred for a moment. Laris? I had forgotten dear they were standing beside me. You saved him, again. Her voice was neutral. Yes, I shook my head. I don't know, dear, dear. I don't know. He hurts so much. 
She looked at me questioning, the first time with tears flowing from both eyes. I stopped the hurt, but for how long? Don't let him get up, tell him he has a chill. How long? I knew what she meant. If he rests, if he is quiet, perhaps half a year, but that's just a guess. He could have died today, but he doesn't want to. I... That afternoon, I paid Rayson two coppers for the loan of his wagon and followed it, and the red oak door chest out to Brettel's house. In case it was to be a surprise, I had covered it with a blanket. On the way across the avenue and toward the north road, we pulled up for a cavalry troop returning. A single prisoner, blindfolded, hands tied behind her back, wearing green leathers, swayed upon the last horse. A dark splotch stained her short, cut blonde hair. The prefix troops had left her an empty scabbard, perhaps because disoriented and wounded. She still radiated order. The four horses bore only empty saddles, and the reek of disorder, of chaos, was faint, as if it expended in whatever battle they had fought. Make way, make way, clink, dink. Make way, make way. Sensing primarily tiredness and pain, nothing resembling new cast chaos, despite my awareness extension. I waited until the troop had passed. Still, I was on the edge until the wagon pulled inside the big stone warehouse. The woman in green bothered me. She could have been Rin or Crystal. She wasn't, but she could have been. Laris, you're earlier than I expected. I told you to take your time. He still grinned. Do you want to see it? Delta's at the market square. Using both arms, I moved the chest, still covered from the wagon. Here, Sperlin, Rison's driver, got a copper I couldn't afford. Just go straight back. Thank you, sir. Not until the wagon rumbled down the back ramp and back onto the north road did I turn back to Brettle. You're thinner, Laris, hunted looking. We passed the cavalry troop. Lots of empty saddles. Brettel just shook his head. Why, the Autark isn't bothering him. I didn't know the answer, except there are no more soldiers in Gallus. Do you want to see the chests? I changed the subject back to the reason I had come. Of course, of course. After lifting the blanket gently, I waited, watching his face. He looked over for a long time. Finally, he turned to me. I can't afford that. That's a piece worthy of Dorman or Sardit, at their best. Well, it wasn't that good. The chest was exquisite, and equal to the lesser, but good pieces my uncle had done. But the comparisons weren't fair. I could see into the wood, and they couldn't. So we stood there for a time, and Brettel kept gazing at the chest. She won't appreciate it. She will. Later, at least. At last, he looked at me. Why are you here, now? To ask you to allow Bostrick to marry Deirdre. Why now? Because Destrin is dying. And I have to leave before it's too late. Before anything becomes too public. I only hope I haven't waited too long. There's a problem, Laris. There, I can see a number. My voice was wry. Even to my own ears. Well, Bostrick has taken over the bench work and the simple chests, and his work is better than Destin's was. You're still the craftmaster. I'm no craftmaster. I felt I had to protest, but my guts turned at the thought that I might actually be approaching that level. No, not if you compare yourself to Perlot and Sardit. And Delta's chest there even gives to you that lie. Even you consider Rastin or Daryl or Hardell or Fellet. Already they can't compare, not at all. Dear Dare's a good seamstress, almost good enough to carry the household on her own. Won't be easy for them. 
but she has a dowry. She does? The mill master asked. Made her a chest like Delta's, not quite as good, and she has a small dowry of five golds. Not too much. Laris, he shook his head. I know it's not really enough, but... Laris, what are you? You're a stranger who has lived here little more than a year, who's held death at bay, who's redeemed my goddaughter's hope and future, and restored her father's honor, and provided a dowry. Would that my own sons go that far? I was embarrassed at the tears rolling down his cheeks, so I said nothing. After all, I hadn't done what I could. Who would have? We need a wedding soon, while Destrin still can appreciate it. Have you asked him? I shrugged. No, I was afraid to upset him. Let me come back with you. Better now than later. Ask him while I am there. Brittle washed the sawdust off his face and uncovered forearms. Changed from his leather apron to, into a linen shirt. And mounted a black mare. All in the time it took for me to drink a grass of Ledbury. We rode back together. Thankfully, we saw no more of the prefect's troops. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this, please like, comment, and subscribe. And turn on notifications so you never miss out on any of my videos. See y'all in the next one. Goodbye!